welcome you all to our webinar on the legal and regulatory aspects of blockchain DLTs. Uh, it's going to be about one and a half hours in, in total. Uh, I'm pleased to have with me Dr. Dirk Zitzer, Professor of Law, University of Luxembourg, uh, and Professor Joe Tanaga, Professor of Law, Freire University, uh, Brussels. And Dirk's going to talk about contracts and conflict of laws aspects, and Joe's going to talk about criminal law aspects of uh, blockchain uh, DLTs. And I'll look into the regulatory frameworks and positions that will be involved. And indeed, we decided to have this webinar because there's been so much excitement and development around uh, blockchain DLTs. There's a bit ledger technologies, but very little uh, investigation uh, of the legal aspects, a lot on the regulatory aspects. So we thought we'd combine it and look at, um, at the specifically the contract issues and the criminal law uh, issues. So before we go further, um, a bit about the DFS Observatory here in New York. Uh, it's uh, uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It uh, looks at policy and regulation around digital financial services around the world. Uh, you can go to our website. We have a very comprehensive database of laws and regulations around fintech and digital financial services. Uh, now I have about uh, 60 countries and 800 laws and regulations live for you to test and look at, uh, as well as recordings of our webinars, some publications, a lot of news, uh, resources, glossaries, country uh, focus areas too. So um, when you can, take a look at it. Uh, we enjoy your feedback. This is the team at uh, Columbia. Um, Mike Weschler is with me here today. He's uh, handling the technical aspects of the webinar. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Professor Dirk. Uh, he's the ADA Chair in Financial Law and Inclusive Finance, University of Luxembourg. And I'm proud to say that he's listed in the top 20 legal scholars worldwide measured by downloads in the last 12 months on uh, Social Sciences Review Network due to his recent work on FinTech and financial inclusion. He's the sole European in that list, and that's, that's highly commendable. Well done, Dirk. Um, he's also co-author of AFI's Alliance of Financial Inclusion's FT4FI report. Uh, and numerous other uh, accolades, and um, uh, which wouldn't fit into just one PowerPoint slide. Uh, Joe uh, is professor of law at the Freie University of Brussels, a distinguished academic with over 35 years professional experience in corporate and, uh, law and finance. Uh, former deputy attorney general for Hawaii, in the U.S. Former senior investment banker with Nomura and he's an author, co-author, and editor of 88 academic publications, including six uh, major books. And that's me, um, Leon Perlman, head of the observatory, very involved in the ITU and FIGI Financial Inclusion Global Initiative, uh, which looks at um, uh, a number of issues, technical and policy-wise, uh, relating to financial inclusion. So, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dirk, who's going to take us through the contract, contract and conflict of laws aspects of blockchain DLTs. And again, please mute your microphones. And if you have any questions, please put that in the chat box. And we'll address the questions towards the end of the uh, Dirk's presentation. But please don't speak out any questions. It's only please. OK, so over to Dirk in Luxembourg. Thanks, Leon. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's um, on uh, the webinar today. Uh, my slides will be on in a second, I think, and uh, this gives me the chance uh, to say hello to everybody. Uh, we will discuss blockchain um, and uh, uh, distributed ledger technology and smart contracts, in particular from a cross-border comparative law and conflict of law perspective. Um, uh, for now, um, I will. Oh, I, I think that we will put another slide deck on in a minute, and then we can continue. Um, for now, uh, I think we can best start out by briefly looking at what distributed ledgers are, um, and uh, from that we have to understand what the traditional way of storing data is. And the traditional uh, way of storing data is basically a concentrated ledger. When you look at uh, 
a specific type of passport, how it is issued today. Simply, you have one central authority from which this passport is uh, getting every authority. When you lose a passport, uh, the data in the centralized ledger will be used to redo, reprint the passport again. Um, in the world of blockchain, uh, we have a different organization. Uh, we have plenty of different computers communicating and cooperating in ensuring that the data that is stored is the very data that was stored in the beginning. We call it distributed ledger. So rather than deriving the authority from one centralized computer, we have plenty of computers uh, engaging with each other in a specific type of process that ensures that the um, information is correct. This idea, of course, is very ancient. It's not a novel idea. So I give you here a picture of the rye, the stone money from the uh, center, 15th century Polynesian islands. Back then, it was a circle of wise old men who sat together and agreed on who these stones uh, uh, are owned by. And uh, these old wise men together were a kind of distributed ledger because they agreed. They had some type of consensus mechanism to find out which of these stones belong to whom. And this is exactly the system that we also use today in our blockchain transaction. A blockchain is now one additional feature. Rather than having just a distributed ledger, we have also a specific way of storing the data by all of the nodes, the computers that are attached to the respective ledger system. The way it is stored is basically in a very strict order, and this order is determined by the time that the respective data points are stored on the chain. The time determines where in a series of data storage transactions a specific data point will be added to the previous, and, uh, pre the previous data, and the next data that is stored will be added behind it. So you can see it here. In the slide that I have, we have one additional data point that shall be added. There's just one point in the chain where this additional data point can be added to. And afterwards, all of that is bundled together by virtue of time in addition to a timestamp. So when you want to corrupt the data, and this is the whole purpose of, of a blockchain to ensure that data manipulation doesn't take place, you have to corrupt not only the data stored on one computer, but on all of these computers simultaneously. And at the same time, you need to corrupt them in a very way that at all of these computers, uh, you corrupt the same files in the same second. Otherwise, there will be a certain um, uh, failure being obvious. And so it could be detected that someone tries to hack the chain. In fact, this is rendering cyber attacks much more difficult than if you have just one computer as long as all the nodes have the same security level as the centralized ledger before. Let me introduce two other terms that you often hear here. So the one is the distinction between permissioned and permissionless blockchains. Uh, the permission blockchain is basically a kind of virtual private network, while the permissionless blockchain is a network where in theory everyone can participate that downloads the respective software and meets other additional requirements set up by the uh, network code. Um, the difference is that in the case of permissioned blockchains, you know your peers and uh, anonymity is usually not ensured in the same manner as in permissionless blockchain, where it is entirely random who takes place. But on the other hand, we have a trade-off when it comes to governance. Um, when you know people that participate and you may also know their stake in the system, uh, usually you have some hierarchy deriving from that. When you do not know the people, it's much more difficult to determine uh, when, for instance, a certain software code should be updated. And so there's a certain random factor in the governance system. When you try to define how basically the um, consensus is found among all nodes, there are two basic models. There is a stake-based model and the work-based model. The work-based model is the one that we see in the most famous black blockchain application, Bitcoin, uh, where you have to solve a certain mathematical puzzle, while in uh, the, uh, very often in the permission blockchain, we see some proof-of-stake models. So that basically, like in, in, a, in, in a public corporation, if you hold 10% uh, 
of the stakes, you have a voting right of 10%, and if you hold, let's say, 30%, you have 30% of voting rights, and thereby come to terms. It's very important to understand that blockchain is not a solution to all problems that we have in the world, but only to a very limited subset. And this subset is in particular the trust problem when storing data. Usually, when you have data stored on a computer, you don't know whether someone tempered with the data. And this is the key problem that distributed ledger technology and blockchain should address. We have two other side effects. For instance, very often due to the fact that all nodes have to be involved in the consensus mechanism, we can use blockchain in order to spread information among multiple devices more or less simultaneously, not exactly simultaneously, but more or less simultaneously. And we can ensure a certain permanent storage due to the linkage of the data in a block. However, we have many problems that are not addressed by blockchain. In particular, blockchain doesn't turn inaccurate data into accurate data. The other thing is, with the blockchain typically comes a certain degree of governance issues, in particular in anonymous or public blockchains. Um, there you typically find issues um, how to decide upon how a certain code shall be removed or updated or uh, renovated in a different way. Another issue that comes with blockchain quite a bit is the data privacy. Due to the fact that the information is spread over multiple computers, typically we have issues uh, deriving um, uh, from the fact that confidential data will not be confidential anymore when spread over the blockchain. And of course, with that, it's obvious that a blockchain distributed ledger is not good for everything, but then you have to make use of it at certain points where the trust problem when data is stored is at the core <clears throat> and other issues are not present. Regardless of the limitation of distributed ledgers, we have a number of use cases where it would make a lot of sense uh, to rely on blockchain and distributed ledger, in particular, every type of title register, clearing and settlement, uh, KYC and money laundering checks, but also in the case of virtual currency, which is another form of title register in a way, um, but also we have found certain use cases in the context of initial coin offerings, delivery chains, disaster help, I can go on and on and on. From a legal perspective, the use of distributed ledger and blockchain is not without risk. When you ask people that come from the technology side why certain risks should occur, um, we need to be aware that there are limitations in the use of distributed ledger and blockchain. For instance, we have certain moments when not all data are distributed among the ledgers, and this is where certain instances happened in the past where, uh, for instance, data were hacked, like um, the wallet hack, the hot wallet hacks that we saw in a number of cases, usually leading to enormous losses. Then uh, we have another weak spot, if you want so, uh, on the side of a blockchain distributed ledger that comes from the fact that um, the current technology level is not likely to be the future uh, technology level. So for instance, right now we believe that the mathematical models that are presented as part of the mining process in uh, Bitcoin are very hard to solve. But we all know that there are the huge development um, effort in developing quantum computers. And as soon as these quantum computers are alive and well working, we believe that they would probably be able to find the mathematical problem in a much shorter period of time than expected by the Bitcoin makers. And that could, of course, uh, shake uh, up the power balance in the Bitcoin system. And of course, another thing that has happened before is that the update uh, software that we upload when we have certain blockchains in place um, may <coughs> create difficulties because they wouldn't function as they are announced to do. And maybe one aspect that has become very obvious in the last months is that we have very difficult uh, legal problems coming from the permanent transparency, um, uh, the fact that um, the data stored on uh, blockchain are more or less impossible to delete, have, uh, of course, issues when you have to delete the data. 
The most extreme example I'm aware of is that of uh, little kids that are uh, the data of uh, those little kids are stored on the blockchain. That's of course a serious breach of um, uh, personalized data rules uh, on a very, very sensitive level. And when you cannot delete those data on the blockchain, you can imagine that this will have some civil law, uh, civil liability effects. And we can think the same uh, of, for instance, um, uh, confidential uh, blueprints of industrial products and everything else. All of that can lead to serious uh, civil liability claims uh, being uh, launched against all nodes in the chain. And of course, this uh, can be paired up with, uh, for instance, uh, some antitrust trouble coming from the fact that maybe inside the blockchain, um, the cooperation among the modes is deemed something to be anti-competitive conduct, in which case you would also have serious antitrust penalties. I just give you these examples, not because they happen every instance and every second, but just uh, to explain why a lawyer like me is thinking about blockchain probably a bit different than the, <clears throat> than the um, uh, technology side would do. And if there is now a liability event, the crucial question is who will pick up the bill? And uh, here, from a legal perspective, it's important to understand that the participation in the blockchain is something that you do willfully. You willfully download the software, you willfully lock into the blockchain system uh, when you use it. And that is typically the point where we attach a certain liability from a legal perspective. When you look across countries, you have entirely different ways how this cooperation among computers is captured by the law. We have three different major families of law, which we look at from a private law perspective. We have the company partnership law, we have the contract law, and the tort law or law of delict, how it's called in the French Roman uh, family of laws. When you look at all of these three families, uh, you find in some countries reasons for liability under one of these concepts. In order to give you here an example, very often, if there is some type of significant financial interest involved, uh, we would find in almost all countries of the world that the cooperation among the nodes could include a contract, a multi-party contract, so that all parties together deliver on the promises they have given. And if the promises they have given is a proper functioning on the blockchain, they will be held for, to liability if this is not the case. Another aspect that can result in liability is a partnership analogy, and we have that in particular in continental Europe quite far, in Germanic countries and countries like Japan and China, which rely also on the same legal doctrine. Um, we may find the legal argument that what the blockchain is, is in fact a kind of unregistered partnership, and that would lead also to liability of all partners involved, similar to multi-party contracts. And and this is the last one, and that's very interesting and at the same time very hard to manage from a contractual perspective. We have tort law, finally. So um, in particular, the picture of uh, the little kids that I mentioned that are uh, illicitly acquired and stored on the blockchain, it, that could uh, result in a tort law claim based on infringement of personality rights or um, uh, respective uh, <coughs> protective law that is designed to protect little kids from these type of incidents. So you see, we have different legal concepts to cover the blockchain participation. If something's going wrong, that may result to liability or in the one or the other way. When we look now on it from a comparative law perspective, um, we may get to different results based on uh, the respective doctrine on which we rely on. So for instance, um, a tort liability come, can come to different results as partnership and contract law liability, for instance, on the damage side. In some cases, you have just to deliver the damages of the wrong inflicted upon the victim. In other cases, you may have triple damages or um, also to cover the, <clears throat> the damages as if the contract would have been uh, uh, fulfilled on each side. So you see here are different results depending on which country you look at. But the one thing that can be for sure is that in all jurisdictions, you have some ground for liability. And I and my colleagues who looked into that question have uh, covered more than 20 jurisdictions. And so this result is relatively speaking proof. 
When you start designing a blockchain, of course, you have to respond to these type of uh, legal divergence, but also to the liability risk. If you incur an activity and you do not think about legal risks, then this is not good business planning. So in this case, what can you do? Yeah, well, first of all, active and passive participation in the blockchain may make a difference because uh, when you're just receiving data stored in the blockchain, it's a different thing as if you just store them, so that if you're a node, then you have to consider whether you deal with business or with consumer. Very often, business is easier to deal with from a contractual perspective. That means the business entities can, for instance, agree that there is a low liability or no liability or no only liability in case of uh, gross negligence, while when consumers are involved, very often these type of um, uh, liability waivers are held void by the courts. So consumer involvement typically means a greater degree of legal risks on the side of the consumers. Then, <clears throat> of course, um, there may be a certain distribution of functions about all the nodes involved in the blockchain. And if you structure them accordingly, maybe you can turn some of them into a partner, service providers and others just in bystanders and then exclude them from liability. My long story, keep it short, is kept short is um, you need to think about who is doing what and who is supporting the blockchain and those who have the largest interest and who mainly contribute to the blockchain are typically those who stand in the middle of any type of liability problem that arises later on. Uh, it's important to know that simply by writing down that, let's say, the law of uh, the moon applies to this blockchain or by other uh, uh, choice of law clauses, the problem is not settled. Because um, every conflict of law uh, regulations in the world have typically uh, some, um, some clauses that defend of extraterritorial um, uh, contract clauses. So only to a very limited extent, you can simply write into your clauses that, for instance, U.S. law should not apply uh, when it comes to, to, to um, liability. And in particular, in the case of tort liability, courts tend to override these clauses quite often. So here um, it may be that although you think you have covered uh, your risks, there may be some risks coming from the fact that there's tort liability involved out of which you cannot contract out. So let me continue. What is the likely result? I do not think that the likely result short term due to this liability risk is that we see very many uh, high volume blockchains with a lot of with lot of um, um, <clears throat> with lot of uh, um, public participants. I'd rather think that we will see more or less concentrated blockchains of, of very very big firms that together provide a blockchain or blockchain or we will even see a kind of um, distributed ledger. Um, that is run just by one entity that is owning a number of computers, maybe 5,000 computers, and all of them function as a node because the distributed ledger does not require that the computers are owned, are owned by different people. In order to achieve the uh, beneficial technology effects, it's enough uh, to have these computers, but not it's not required that they're owned by different people. So one way to structure it legally would build a liability shield by putting all of these computers in one legal entity. Um, why is all of this important? Because the potential of blockchain is so enormous and this uh, uh, enormous potential comes, for instance, from the fact that we can use the information stored on the DLT in a very specific way. Probably the most efficient use will be on the stock exchanges. Right now, there are trillions in assets uh, uh, held up by so-called margin payments. That's a kind of security that is delivered and to ensure that the transaction will go through. And if we can instantaneously reduce the information asymmetry in those transactions, we can free trillions of dollars. And that will lead, of course, for a huge push for all the economies involved. Um, on the other hand, we have to understand that the end of privacy associated with it may have certain implications. And then also, if the data that is stored is not correct, uh, are the basis of all financial transactions in the world that we may create an additional degree of systemic risk of which we have not thought about 10 years ago. 
Um, another major use case of distributed ledger technology is, of course, in the initial coin offerings. I cannot go here into the details, so I refer to a paper that we've written about it. But they generate enormous funding. It is uh, a giant market in the meanwhile. And um, in some countries, it has even exceeded, the amount exceeded, by, um, generated by ICOs have exceeded the amounts uh, gathered and delivered by venture capital funds. So the problem with them, is uh, the opportunities are obvious, but the problem with them may lie in consumer protection. Then very often we see cross-border structures where the enforcement of financial law is very low, and that of course will risk a regulatory backlash. And typically these things come at high cost. Then we have anti-money laundering concerns. And in our database, we could show that there's an enormous degree of fraud involved. I think uh, we come to numbers that suggest that probably half of all of these structures may have some fraud or uh, not uh, so well uh, <clears throat> thought of perspective. And of course, many of them may be overpriced. So let me go to my last few slides. Um, that is, I want to address the question of smart contracts. It's important that a smart contract is not a contract from a legal perspective, it is a code, a specific code that applies a strict if-then connection. So for instance, if you press one, I will wire 1,000 from your account uh, to a different bank. And this limits the choice of human beings. And uh, since choice of human beings can in transactions be reason for delay and of failure, um, the fact that we uh, take out the humans out of the transaction can enhance efficiency and reduce transaction cost. It's important that the contract is itself enforced by the code, so by an automatic function. And this is also the reason why we worry a bit, because it may be that the code does not really reflect what's in the law. So, for instance, consider that maybe um, we have uh, to um, uh, ask someone to leave his house. Then we have a strict legal requirement uh, that we have to send warning notices in a very specific order. And if the code is not following these orders, then of course it would be illegal to use the code. So on the other side of the smart contract stand, that smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. So that means um, they are only as smart as those who have coded them. Um, and the world is sometimes a bit complex, in particular when lawyers are involved. And uh, of course, it's, it's getting maybe a bit more difficult. And um, we have to consider that we sometimes don't know which law applies because simply uh, uh, telling people that the law of the US will apply to this code is usually not valid in other countries. And uh, as far as we see it, code is not law, but we have to consider the relationship between the two. And there are three things that law can do to smart contracts. First of all, the code needs the law to secure its legitimacy. What do I mean by that? Well, simply taking away money from someone is usually called robbery, or uh, that's something that thieves are doing or robbers. Yeah? So we need to have a legal underpinning for smart contracts doing the action, and those must be considered, must consider the protected factors. And then we must somehow include a, a, a legal regime for errors, because errors is something that the law typically provides for in very particular um, ways, uh, for instance, um, uh, when you declare the wrong thing, you mean A, but you say B, then the law attaches a certain type of regime that you have to uh, consider after that. You simply need not, cannot take everyone uh, uh, straight to the word of A. And finally, we need to ensure that whatever you do to the code is valid in terms of the choice of law and choice of jurisdiction clauses. So here we need the law to secure the legitimacy. On the other hand, we need the law to provide for workarounds because maybe the very fact that something is not mutable on the blockchain means that we need to provide for different ways of reverse transactions. Take my picture example, uh, the reverse transaction of annulment is not possible, so the reverse transaction would be damages, pen penalty payments given to the respective owner of the property rights, of the privacy rights. And my final aspect in this regard is that the simplest way of ensuring that uh, the code will uh, that the code embedded in the smart contract is accepted is that the law enables for a certain maybe slow but at least existing 
way of reversing deficiencies in the code. So if, for instance, you have wired 100 either uh, due to the smart contract from account one to two, the law can ensure that the value of 100 either is returned from account one to two. To sum up, we have a blockchain and distributed ledger environment that was developed with the assumption that it functions best in the absence of law, but unfortunately there is law and we have certain legal consequences attaching from breaches of confidentiality and so on that may result in liability. And these liability events may occur when making use of blockchain and they must be carefully considered before putting to use blockchain distributed ledgers, in particular in a business context. Uh, however, we have ways to respond to these um, liability risks. We can adjust, for instance, the choice of law, we can adjust the contractual scheme, and we can assign functions to certain parties. And uh, with the exception that, of course, when consumers are involved, this is not so easy. Please consider that these liability uh, um, risk make for certain use cases, the blockchain not be the technology of choice and permissioned blockchains may be easier to handle than public blockchains. As to smart contracts, as I laid out, they are very efficient in enhancing speed and potentially in reducing transaction costs, but they only work smoothly when they are soundly embedded in the applicable legal environment. So a legal layer, including choice of law and so on, is probably the outside of the code world embedding that we need to hold up the legitimacy of an otherwise lawful smart contract, unlawful smart contract. With that, I'm done. Uh, Leon, thank you very much for attending our little webinar, and I hand over to Leon to continue with the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. I think uh, going through the complexity of your slides, uh, it's fortuitous that we have this webinar because the, the complexities are evolving, not being solved necessarily. And as things, uh, if, uh, as blockchain becomes more and more of a, uh, integrated into our lives, I think these issues are going to percolate out. But in the meantime, I, I would urge everybody to look at uh, Dirk's papers along with uh, Ross Buckley and uh, Doug Arne. Uh, that their papers are really, really good, and no wonder they, they've uh, been downloaded so much on SSRN. Uh, and in the meantime, I've, some questions have come through, but uh, if you could perhaps uh, send on the chat to the moderator some questions. Please don't open your microphone to, to say them, but uh, uh, click on the, on the chat um, button at the bottom uh, and uh, send it through to the, um, to the moderator, please. It's sort of a quotation icon at the bottom of your of your screen if you if you're on a computer. Some people have dialed in. Okay, so um, Dirk, we've got uh, a, 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 some questions that have already come through, some which we might have addressed in in, uh, in 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 some form, but I'll read them out nonetheless. Uh, from Milana in Paris, how analogous are smart contract terms to real world contract terms in terms of performance and reasonableness? The reasonableness and the, um, let's say, level of degree of maturity entirely depends on the planning before you code it. Um, a smart contract is not thinking of its own. So if the smart contract is properly designed and well thought through, it can be extremely efficiency enhancing. Um, it's just a little bit like you must plan it and design it and structure it as you would do in the real world and simplifications typically don't pay out if you don't. Okay, uh, thank you. From Ashwini Satnu in India, is there a requirement of predicted fraud mitigation and fraud business analytics in the blockchain technology as an additional strategy formation? This is um, basically, um, there is a two parts of the answer. The one thing is, even if there is not a law, it may make a lot of sense to protect your own balance sheet by doing so. Because when you're involved in fraud activity, um, we have our criminal law presentation a little bit later. So um, Joe may uh, uh, examine this part a bit uh, 
um, more in detail. But if you are involved in criminal activity, that typically leads to some type of tort liability. And as I explained it, tort liability is a type of liability that's very hard to shield against. So you have a natural inclination to protect yourself. Um, on the other hand, is there any real requirement to engage in fraud detection? The answer is, if you are a licensed entity, in particular in the financial intermediary scene, yes, there is. You have to protect your clients to the best, and if you're, in, you're involved in a business that's potentially exposed to fraud, then you owe a fiduciary duty to your clients to make sure that there are no fraud activities involved. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, one final question. Uh, should public blockchains be, as far as liability goes, be treated the same as grassroots open, service, open source software? At what point in a developer changing the the, the native, if say, Ethereum uh, or blockchain, uh, Bitcoin blockchain code from open source uh, would move from open source to strict liability for the developer. Thank you very much. In fact, this is a very interesting question and we laid it out in our paper more extensively. Um, there is, in fact, an analogy that you can draw and we all know that in open source software licenses, there's typically a wide liability waiver. Um, However, it is uncertain how far the courts will uh, hold up this waiver when it comes push to show. We have, in fact, cases where these waivers have been avoided by the courts. So um, uh, there is an analogy, yes, but this analogy doesn't provide protection in the case of black public blockchains because it doesn't provide sound protection in the case of open source software either. Right. Um, I think we're out of time. Thank you, Dirk, so much. I think you've covered a, a, a large uh, body of law and ground. Uh, and if you want to contact um, uh, Dirk by email, you'll see his email up on the screen. Um, if, if you can't capture it now, just ping us here at Columbia, and we're happy to pass on your details to, uh, to, to Dirk, or just um, check out his papers at ssrn.com as well. Um, and Thank you, Dirk. I appreciate your time. Uh, I think you have to go soon. Thank uh, you, Leon, for and thanks for all the audience. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to move now, to, um, in the interest of time, to Joe Tanaga in um, in London, uh, and he's going to talk to us about the criminal law of blockchain and DLT, some critical reflections. And again, while um, we go through uh, Joe's talk, if you're going to come up with some questions and pop it into the into the chat box uh, and send it to the moderator and the organizer. Thank you. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Leon. Uh, thanks, Dirk, for a fantastic introduction to the blockchain and mentioning, uh, I think, um, predisposing me, I might say, to some of the critical reflections that I'll be making in my own presentation. Um, <clears throat> let's just get started. Hold on. So basically what I'm going to do is talk about some uh, ancient and modern principles of law relating to criminal law, uh, take apart a few legal cases in the last couple of years that show us what's happening in the criminal law area, and then actually blue sky it in terms of what's happening today and what should we expect in terms of trends in the criminal law. Uh, this, this is a very interesting question that was given to me by, a question given to me by Leon. Now, I don't know whether I really have any answer to this because these, these things are live. Um, <clears throat> let's go to, if, if we go to a jurisdiction, imagine a jurisdiction with no regs or the regs are inconsistent. In those, in those situations, what do we have? What, what can we depend on? In other words, what presidential value is the law to us? And in the common law jurisdictions, we just point and click, you might say, to history. And uh, uh, there'll be a few legal conceptions that I will uh, pick up on through these slides. But one, one of the major things that we should always consider is that there's substantive criminal law in common law jurisdictions that's very ancient. So it's important to keep in mind very simple things like uh, for example, what does criminal law mean in terms of remedy? Well, basically, it means go to prison or pay fines to the government. Beyond that, we would um, probably draw a broad line to <clears throat> mandatory injunctions, 
types of remedies where we have constructive trust. That's something that I'll talk about in these slides. So you might say the very basis of what we're thinking about in terms of the criminal law is very ancient. And putting together these ancient concepts with very new technology, is it very difficult? Well, yes it is, because it's a matter of definition. We'll come to these in, in a few moments. For example, uh, the notion of inconsistencies in terms of the law. Here's an example that's live um, right at this moment. Child porn links on blocks you host as a node on the blockchain. Criminal liability for the nodes or not? Um, <clears throat> This is a difficult question, and all I can do now is pose what might be thought of as um, legal analogies. And I'll draw your attention just off the top of my head to the 1880s, uh, common law. And around that time, in fact, 1860s and a little bit before, we had the notion of a common carrier. So you would, uh, as a bailor, bailee relationship, try to deliver your goods from point A to point B, the common carrier would be transport. There's nothing you could do in the medium. They would have to take care and make sure that nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened to the property that you delivered. Of course, something would happen. The property would be destroyed or damaged. And uh, the common law doctrine evolved around what we would call today strict liability. Now, that's not been mentioned by Dirk, but actually strict liability is a very important way of thinking about, let's say, the verges of um, civil to criminal law because we have a, a social construction in which um, we cannot pinpoint exactly who should be blamed, but we, we will, at the very least, um, blame or apportion blame to those people who have, in a sense, uh, a monopolistic <clears throat> uh, common carrier view over things. Now, to draw that legal analogy a little bit more tightly, what it means is that there would be social insurance available at that point. We'll come to that in a few cases that, we, uh, that I'll draw your attention to in the slides. So some principles of criminal law for block, blockchain and DLT draw your attention to the Congress may de delegate legislative power to the administrative officer, including imprisonment and fines. This goes back quite far before even securities laws in the 1930s. What does it mean? It means that <clears throat> at the level of the local officer, that person has the discretion to decide whether the person committing a particular act should or should not go to jail, should or should not pay fines. Now this delegated administrative uh, power is something that we don't really think about too much, but it's, it's ambient. And it's very, very important to think of uh, when you're thinking about criminal law. So when we think about another great principle in criminal law, and that was constructed in the 1930s through the Securities Act, and to put it in one line, uh, bad actors will be prosecuted to protect investors. This is actually a reversal of the common law. The common law principle for, for thousands of years was um, buyer beware, caveat emptor. With the securities law, there was a requirement that <clears throat> bad actors would not only be prosecuted but controlled, and that there would be certain remedies which would be given to the local officer to protect investors. To protect investors exactly from what? We'll get to that in a second. Um, currently, we have a statement by the SEC and the CFTC, which I read to you in quote, when market participants engage in fraud under the guise of offering digital instruments, whether characterized as virtual currencies, coins, tokens, or etc., the SEC and the S CFTC will look beyond form, examine the substance of the transaction, prosecute violations of, this, of the Federal Securities and, Com and Commodities Act. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's very important to understand, in terms of criminal law, that that which is said to be, say, a coin or token, ICO and so on, 
will be looked at in terms of the framework of whether those particular even physical items are actually being represented properly. And what do we mean by properly? And here's a little bit of a, a deep think. Properly means that one needs to consider the effect, the effect, the effect of the representation in the minds of the buyers. I don't know whether that's even possible, but that's what the securities laws in 1933-34 did. It changed the common law into this new type of federal type of presumption, um, which uh, modern scholars call information asymmetry, but what we call uh, in terms of the criminal law is that we, we look at particular situations under these particular uh, securities regulations and decide whether a particular set of facts before us come under those laws. Um, <clears throat> give you an example. Logically, what this means is that <clears throat> the criminal law as it's, being, as it's been developed through securities acts, 1933, 34, and 1940s investment acts, they're actually, it's quite simple really. It's about bad actors require gullible investors to thrive. And the government therefore steps in and tries to make sure that the gullibility of the investors is not so great that um, it corrupts the entire market. We have, in many instances when we're talking about Bitcoin, blockchain, and so on, uh, representations which make no sense to a common sense observer. Indeed, they're kind of ridiculous. We have, for example, make 1% per day on your investment, or there's no risk in this investment. These are just what I would call mad uh, representations. And yet, um, these are what ordinary individuals buy into. Uh, just a little story here in terms of how bad it could really get. After almost 80 years of securities, securities law enforcement, we, had, we have probably a linear relationship correlation with the size of fraud versus, uh, in relation to the amount of laws. We draw your attention to a particular egregious event when one of the greatest fraudsters ever in securities, Bernie Madoff, was sentenced to 150 years imprisonment. Um, Judge Jenny Chen was asked, is this cruel and unusual punishment? I mean, we have limits under the U.S. Constitution as to what constitutes criminal law enforcement and remedies. And he said, well, what turned my mind was that the witness, the last witness that he heard said, that this is the last, this is the, all the amount of money that I had, and I was putting it in, into you, Mr. Madoff. I need to know whether I can trust you. And so, putting his arm around me, he said, Don't worry, my deal. I'll take care of you and your special needs daughter. So, even though we're thinking uh, that blockchain is a kind of impersonal, beautiful, smart contract that maybe gives us greater glory and efficiency. When it comes down to um, criminal law, what we're really looking at are bad actors. So in, when we look at the, the notion of bad actors and blockchain and DLTs, what do we see? Well, we see a huge number of offerings um, which a lot of people are saying should be thought of as securities. But this isn't really what I want to speak about. You could look at this particular example of how a major consulting firm is looking at the blockchain and in insurance and all its applications. But even if we have all these applications, beyond those applications, we still need to think, like Dirk said, in terms of what is the liability and beyond tort liability, at the very basis of our society is criminal law. The example, Internal Revenue Service states there are nearly a thousand cryptocurrencies in existence. 
Of those, how many are really going to survive? Of those, how many representations to normal in, to ordinary investors will be considered to be not fraudulent? Well, in the current state of uh, legal thinking, at least in the United States, with regards to um, what we can say about the law of Bitcoin, blockchain, and DLTs is as follows. I'll just read out these points, and if you want in the question and answers, you can take me up on any of these. First, they're not legal tender. It can be used as a medium of exchange with counterparties who will accept it. What this means is that <clears throat> they could be thought of uh, as fungible. Now, fungibility is something that we haven't really talked about in terms of blockchain. And in a sense, it's in opposition to the notion of immutability. We'll come back to that when we talk about uh, strict liability. There's no regulatory approval that's required for a person to use these types of um, instruments to purchase goods or services. There's no regulatory approval required to issue or create these, uh, these coins, although a person who does so may become subject to federal and state anti-money laundering laws and securities regs. This is absolutely the case in the United States. Um, they're traded on exchanges that are licensed as money transmitters in a number of states. We'll go through one case very quickly in the next couple of slides. Uh, these, these coins and ICOs are now treated as deposits by the Federal Reserve Board. So they have no protection, in other words. You would not be protected if you use these instruments uh, under the laws of the Federal Reserve. They're not treated as a security by the SEC, although the SEC may treat initial coin offerings or Bitcoin Ponzi schemes as creating securities. This is probably uh, an area of law that will be developed to such a heightened extent that I could, I, could, I could conceive of there being specific bar associated, that is, groups of lawyers specializing in this area of litigation. Bitcoin treated as a commodity by the CFTC, which has authorized Bitcoin futures to be traded on major commodity exchanges and has no jurisdiction over the Bitcoin cash or spot market. I think this particular point is something that uh, deserves a lot of attention because as um, <clears throat> Dirk said, maybe up to 50% of these issues in Bitcoin, et cetera, may be subject to fraud or have been stolen uh, if you think about those, if you think about um, the risk of the underlying instrument to these futures traded on these major exchanges under the CFTC jurisdiction, I think um, there's something terribly wrong actually for having those types of, for having that type of collateral backing onto futures and options. Bitcoin is treated as property by the IRS, and Bitcoin transactions are subject to capital gains treatment and reporting requirements. There are literally just less than 100 people who have reported uh, to the IRS in terms of their uh, Bitcoin and blockchain type of profits, whilst we know that there have been billions of dollars made through these exchanges. Regulatory actions include issuing investor alerts, initiating enforcement actions to prevent fraud, and rejected proposals to register cryptocurrency funds. One of the major points I'll, I'll make uh, or hope to persuade you is that because of the structure of Bitcoin and blockchain and DLTs, in order, to, in order for the criminal enforcement agencies to actually get on top of this, they're going to have to initiate and prevent fraud, you might say ab initio, uh, such as emergency freezing of assets. The U.S. regulation on these instruments, as well as virtual currencies, is minimal or non-existent. So this means that we don't really have any standards uh, that we can point to that would help us under help us as uh, as ordinary citizens and regulators to uh, to consider whether the criminal criminal offenses have been have been made in these areas. And a big prediction, enforcement actions against bad actors will increase in 2018 and the years ahead if the value of Bitcoin increases substantially as in the payment systems or financial markets. And finally, 
Um, one one uh, view that we need to take into account is what the investment managers and fin financial professionals are now seeing in terms of Bitcoin. Uh, here in, in London, one of the jokes is, is that Bitcoin in 2018 is, is just a failed startup. Is the Bank Secrecy Act stifling good business ideas? Now, as we know, uh, under the Bank Secrecy Act, um, which, is be, which is enforced by FinCEN, um, there's certain requirements that need to be made and permission needs to be gotten by FinCEN in order for um, in order for payment systems to be approved, say these payment platform systems to be approved. Here is one that was uh, recently recently decided by FinCEN in 2014. I, if you take a look at this diagram, what's interesting about this business proposal is that there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it from a from a trading or pure pure profit angle. What we have here is that we have an overseas customer buyer or debtor um, versus a merchant seller or creditor. And in the middle is a company that offers a service to translate the real currency legal tender from the buyer or debtor uh, into a trans uh, into an equivalent amount of Bitcoin less a transfer fee. In other words, this is a service which would help business, which would actually be right in the middle of a market. This is proposed for Latin American hoteliers, um, and if you and if you look at the business model, it's a pretty simple one because the com the proposed company would go out to the virtual currency exchanges do transactions out there, and then uh, create a reserve account for its virtual currencies, thereby having sufficient um, uh, cryptocurrency to uh, fulfill, the, fulfill the transaction in step two. Now, FinCEN said in, it, in its uh, letter decision that there were four conditions of the payment processor that had to be fulfilled. And if you could look at that in, the, in terms of this slide, those are the four conditions, A, B, C, and D. But because this particular uh, proposer uh, did, not have, did not have a clearance and settlement system through a BSA regulated financial institution, in other words, it didn't back onto uh, an institu uh, uh, a BSM um, entity, it would not be able to continue, uh, it would not be able to operate this business under this regulation. Now, if you think about the, the logic of this, it seems kind of silly because it, it, it's iterative. Uh, it would have required another company, say, to come up with a proposal that it in itself would also have to be BSA approved and so on and so forth. So, um, even if you have a good idea, in other words, it may not be the case that that particular good idea using blockchain technology would be approved under FinCEN. Uh, and if, if it's not approved, and you do have to go through the whole nine yards to be MSB, um, you would have to look at the bold here. Each program must designate a compliance person responsible for day-to-day -day compliance. So that's a person, that's not a blockchain, that's not a smart contract. Provide education and training to appropriate personnel. Again, same comment. And provide an independent review to monitor, maintain an adequate compliance program. All of these things are outside the blockchain. And all of these particular requirements would have to be paid for and would entail substantial costs. Um, let's go to another big question. Do we need international coordination when it comes to criminal law? An interesting case, this is quite recent. This is a BTCE case. Um, it was through the FinCEN network, working with the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Northern District of California. The civil penalty was for 110 million. And 
uh, you could read there that we, we see that there was, this is one of the largest exchanges um, in the world, really, for fiat currency converting into virtual currencies. Um, quote, we will hold accountable foreign located money transmitters, including virtual currency exchanges that do business in the United States, when they willfully violate U.S. anti-money laundering laws. Head of FinCEN. This action should be a strong deterrent to anyone who thinks that they could facilitate ransomware, dark net drug sales, or conduct other illicit activity using encrypted virtual currency, and so on. Well, what's interesting about that particular case is not just that Vinny, who ran the BTCA, ran away with a lot of money. What we see is uh, just just after that, in fact, within the last couple of weeks, we see that France and Russia have uh, issued extradition orders to the Greek court, where Vinny is, where Vinny had been arrested, and is, is sitting in jail actually. So the question then is, how do we get Vinny? <laughs> actually, the question is. Um, how is it possible to get Vinny? Because there are people in the United States who were, who were hurt. There are at least 100 plus uh, investors in France whose money was taken. And I'm not sure exactly what the Russian claim is, but the, Russian, the Russians are also asking for extradition of poor Vinny. We do not have any way to coordinate this. And um, this is one of those very, very difficult questions in the procedure of criminal law for which there is no simple answer. Um, let's just skip this. <clears throat> so if you want to go see what, what's happening there in the Greek court, uh, I have a link for you down to the little a little article in Cointelegraph in July 31st, 2018. My, my own comment on this is that it's a mess. There's no coordination. And whilst we have found a bad actor in which, in which he was prosecuted for uh, money laundering, fraud, and so on, um, he's not likely to be taken out of Greece and all the way back to California. Do we need to impose more constructive trust? So this is the idea that whilst we have the criminal law and that we prosecute individuals after the fact, after they've committed these terrible frauds or thefts and so on, it may be the case that um, we need to evolve, or we do have a set of instruments, but we need to use them a little bit more often in terms of catching or preventing the harm that the bad actors intend. So in Arise Bank, there was an emergency asset freeze. Uh, this, is, this decision was issued on January 30th, 2018. Uh, the SEC filed a, in district court in the Dallas and asked that, um, and asked that certain funds be returned. I mean, that, that the, asset, uh, the, the funds that were raised by Arise Bank that were to be used for um, particular types of services, like one that I just is really hard to believe, a Visa card to spend any of its 700 plus cryptocurrencies. Um, the SEC moved very, very quickly and actually got a freezing order. So in a sense, this is a good example of where we could prevent criminal behavior uh, actually exploiting the fact of the gullibility of of the investors and preventing the investors from greater harm. The question really arises is whether we should have more of these types of asset freezes, what I would call constructive trust, even before, um, let's say, even before we have a final trial. In other words, we might we might consider this as part of the regulatory control of securities 
security agents. Now, there's a question with regards to, well, we have all these laws everywhere, and these laws, in some sense, if we take them to heart, may actually dissuade a lot of innovation. And this is the danger. This is a balancing act that needs to be done between encouraging innovation, uh, encouraging people with good ideas to come out with their ideas and get funding, versus catching bad actors. Uh, this is a very hot topic at the moment that's called the Sandbox. Arizona on August 3rd, 2018, created a sandbox which means that this is a, a place where individuals and companies can initiate <clears throat> their blockchain and DLT type company with their products. And with a minimum charge, I think the licensing fee is just 500 bucks. And they get a, they get a license to play, you might say, in the play box for two years. The question arises, however, is it, is it a really a, a free box, i.e., is, so, is it so liberal that one need not consider the federal security laws or the federal uh, anti-money laundering rules? Um, and the answer is simply no. Uh, even though you might get to play in the Arizona sandbox, you still have to comply with AML and security laws. Um, also, at the bottom of that slide, security trading, securities trading, insurance products and services that provide solely deposit-taking functions are not eligible to enter the sandbox. Um, that's taken off the website to the Arizona Deputy Attorney General's, I mean, at the Attorney General's office. And really, that line is in reference to federal securities and financial law. Uh, this is just a little graphic for you to kind of consider whether it's worth going into <clears throat> uh, a sandbox. It's a, really a question of balancing. Do you have a good idea? Do you require capital formation? Do you require risk takers? Well, maybe you should consider Arizona because you can get started with a two-year permit. And do you have to be resident in Arizona? The answer is no. So... Uh, it's an attempt by Arizona authorities to attract capital for these new innovations. Uh, however, you need to consider what actually do you do? I mean, what actually do you need to comply with as an entity in the sandbox? Uh, you need to really consider consumer safety in the sense of whether federal security laws apply. If federal securities law apply, I would suggest as just as a matter of course, that you consider the exemptions of the securities law. Um, we can talk about them in the question and answer bit, but it seems to me quite strange that people who enter into the US with ideas of ICOs, tokenization, and so on, do not make use of securities registration, which would prevent a lot of um, headaches and heartaches later on. And we certainly see a lot of enforcement action coming out of the SEC at the moment. Um, but just come back a little bit in terms of what what is a sandbox? A sandbox, and, and this is I think going to arise in many jurisdictions around the world. A sandbox is really to incentivize those innovators to come and play. That gives them a chance to actually experiment and produce something in a local market and see whether it works. But if it's going to work at all, my suggestion is, as someone who is involved in legal setups and financial law, is that they really need to consider the federal securities laws and AML, etc.
There's also something else um, that's very live, very topical. Do we need to protect the data on blockchain as per Michigan HB 6257? What is that? Well, HB 6257 says that a person who falsely alters, forges, or counterfeits a public record and intends to injure or defraud another person would be prosecuted of a felony. Wow. Punishable by imprisonment for not more than 14 years. That sounds draconian. However, um, as Dirk was... Uh, as Dirk mentioned in his presentation, one of the big problems is immutability. How is it that when you have child porn on your node, you're not going to be held liable? And how is it, and the other side, is that if you have very, very important financial information that you want to keep forever, someone comes in and modifies it. You need to weigh the balance between immutability and what I would say is fungibility of the information. Uh, it's a difficult question, but the Michigan bill, as it stands, is, has created a felony for any type of false alteration, forging, or counterfeit of a public record. Mm. I have some points here, but uh, I'm just going to, I'll leave that for anyone who wishes to look at them and they can either email me or we can talk about it. But the last slide, the last point in the last slide is really my suggestion to everyone who's listening is that if you're coming to the United States or if you have an idea that you think is innovative that makes use of blockchain or DLTs, is that you seriously consider something very, very simple and from my perspective as a securities lawyer, uh, quite lightweight, is to consider a filing for Regulation A, which is an exemption to the securities law. Under Tier 1 of Regulation A, you can ask for up to 20 million in 12 months and the amount of disclosure is very minimal. And uh, for Tier 2, you can ask, that is, you can set out prospectus for 50 million for 12 months. Um, that's all I have to say for now. Is there, if there's any questions, I'm very happy to take them on. Many thanks, Joe, for all that uh, comprehensive exposition. That's an extremely complex area, and I think uh, just from the points that you raised, uh, it's going to get more complex as this evolves. Um, we have one question, and just one question only, just in the interest of time. Um, so a uh, question from Arnold in Los Angeles. We obviously got up quite early for this, so thank you, Arnold. Uh, how do you confiscate and then redistribute a Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency uh, if you don't have the PKI keys? Um, should this be done at a crypto exchange level? Uh, I know Arnold says the FBI did this, but how, did, how is it done? I, the truth is I don't really know how it's done, but it, it's actually... I think a deeper question, it's, it's, it's whether we consider blockchain and its cousins fungible. I mean, like one of the philosophical questions in this area, and it's quite deep, is you know, what is money? Money in the financial system, and as, as far as I know in terms of financial markets, it, it's about fungibility. You can trade yen for dollars and so on. But when we have this technology that says it's going to be kept secret, private, and physically so, and the way we design it is such that no one else can get into it, we want to breach that. We have to reverse that immutability. And when we do that, we make it fungible. <laughs> we turn it into money. So I don't know, actually. I don't know how they do it. Yep, it's an open question, but the FBI seems to have cracked it because I think they uh, they redistributed quite a lot of the Silk Road uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and in fact, I think if I if I recall correctly, some of the FBI agents got ensnared in it because they <laughs> went and they went and uh, confiscated it uh, for their own pocket, and then but got caught. So pseudo anonymity in Bitcoin isn't uh, all that cracked up to be if you can get. Yeah, once it becomes fungible. It's... Yep. 
it's up. It's like uh, cash on the ground. Cash on the ground. <laughs> Joe, thank you very much. And if anybody wants to uh, uh, get hold of Joe, uh, you can ping us at the uh, DFS Observatory info at dfsobservatory.com, and we'd be glad to pass on any messages or questions um, to, to Joe. Thank you, Joe. Um, okay, thank you, Leon. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time, and uh, thank you, everybody, for your, your, your questions. Okay, well, then, uh, the last session uh, is uh, I'm going to present on the regulatory aspects of uh, blockchain DLTs, a very fast evolving sector. In fact, um, just doing this presentation, you kind of have to monitor the uh, activities and, and refresh your slides and update your slides every every couple of days is a new announcement all, uh, all the time um, okay so let's let's jump in just with a to make this um, to make this uh, more understandable here's a little slide I put together on the technology hierarchies uh, so at the top you've got DLTs which is your sort of overriding um, ecosystem, and within that, you've got different types of technologies. So these are the technologies to use to create the application. So, for example, blockchain, which is our first uh, iteration, uh, we get that from uh, the Nakamoto paper in um, in, in 2008, then uh, Ripple, and then um, Hashgraph, which is another iteration, and then uh, applications, uh, for example, is Bitcoin. So cryptocurrency is a means of payment. Now, all of these are, are regulated differently. Uh, and you'll, you'll see from some of the, the exemplars I'm going to bring up for uh, various countries and jurisdictions, uh, each have got uh, different focal points by the regulator. So the DLT itself, the, uh, the applications, and the technologies. So keep that in mind. So these are the regulators that I've uh, would summarize, there are obviously more, but these are most proximate to the DLT blockchain world. Central banks in terms of payments, banking, sandbox, as Joe just mentioned, financial services, licensing of, say, exchanges, security shares, and uh, in terms of ICOs, initial coin offerings, tax, capital gains, financial intelligence units, money laundering. And I'll say that wherever, wherever you go, uh, money laundering is, is, uh, is overriding to anything. So even if there isn't a law, you're your money laundering precepts will, uh, will, will, will will still apply to just about anything. Uh, telecommunications, data protection, sandboxes, and data privacy as uh, and data protection regulations, as Dirk um, uh, mentioned. So, if you want to look at the regulator evolution on crypto, I'm not going to look at cryptocurrencies. I'm just going to crypto for now. This is how I've seen it. Just monitoring this for the past uh, few years. Uh, the regulators just observed it, like, what is this? Then they reacted to it and sometimes closed down things, then stepped back a little bit and regulated with a bit more um, uh, thought. And to the degree that they uh, they can, they've embraced the, the DLT technology and sometimes even the applications. So this is the reaction, just some headlines of the past few days and weeks. Bitcoin prices dropped. As China extends ban on crypto, we'll go to China, Russian police, these 22 cryptocurrency ATMs. RBI in uh, India cracks down on Bitcoin, uh, bans banks from dealing with cryptocurrency traders. Okay. Um, and then UK creates its own India moment by freezing accounts of cryptocurrency users. So this is the React uh, part. Um, and this has evolved from uh, looking at Bitcoin per se to where we are now. Uh, to crypto assets and ETFs, exchange traded funds and sandboxes, and even central bank uh, digital currencies, which are uh, which are evolving. So this evolution has highlighted a, a kind of a tension between regulating uh, crypto trading, whatever that means, ICOs, utility tokens, and the like, um, and cryptocurrencies, versus embracing it for uh, blockchain innovation. In fact. Uh, not only embracing it as a regulator, but allowing it in, to be tested within a, a, a sandbox. As, as Joe so those are the tensions that we, we, we see. And this is the embracing part. So British government, and you saw, you saw the previous slide on the React, uh, where they 
confiscated uh, uh, cryptocurrencies versus the embrace part, which is British government grants millions for blockchain technology research and Reserve Bank of India, which is banning stuff, uh, quietly opens its own cryptocurrency research unit. Um, and then Dubai government, China, um, which bans, has banned Bitcoin, completes digital currency trial and abduction. So you see this tension coming out between the reaction and the embracing by, by regulators of, uh, of the technology. So this is, to summarize it, this is the green is the embracing part of the technologies. Uh, and then they react and then regulating the applications. Um, and, and we're going to, again, perhaps I'm going to see the announcements by various regulators, and there'd be multiple regulators within each country uh, are doing this, sometimes creating a bit of confusion for those in the, the industry, because uh, a port can say one thing, then a, one regulator would say another, another regulator in the same country would say another thing. So it's creating a little, of arbitra a little bit of arbitrage and a bit of confusion for, in fact, a lot of confusion for uh, those those in the industry. And there are some jurisdictions which are joining the dots, if you will, to uh, unscramble this egg and create a, a, a very cogent regulatory framework. And we'll go through that, especially Malta and um, Abu Dhabi and, and Switzerland. Okay, so these are uh, the regulatory issues. The blockchain laws uh, are emerging. Um, Joe mentioned one or two. Uh, where they define a blockchain or try to, and I think the, the one issue regulators are struggling with is whether or not to include uh, this word immutability in it, and I see a lot of them do. I think immutability is a bit of a um, controversial term these days because you can reverse transactions, which is the antithesis of the immutability paradigm. Uh, and some have said, and as I do, the, the better term would be tamper evidence or tamper evidence. So you can see whether or not somebody's tried to, to uh, reverse things. Uh, but reversal as a no-no um, uh, can't ever be done, I think, is is been, been proven to some degree with DAO to, to be a misnomer. So there are, as I said, some uh, regulations, especially in the US, that use uh, immutability. Uh, these laws also recognize smart contracts as real and notarized contracts. Uh, legal recognition of property rights in the blockchain, seeing a lot, the also right to mine, believe it or not. Some some states have codified that you be allowed to mine. Some have said you can't mine, like China. Uh, also the power usage, some local councils in the US have put restrictions on ability to uh, to use the local power grid for mining. Um, and that's come up in local laws and even state laws. Um, even types of data that can be stored. I'm told that Arizona says you can't put, because it's a second amendment right to bear arms state, uh, very pro that, you can't put data about gun registries on the blockchain because that will be there forever. And you just don't want to say the federal government's seen that. Um, so the regulatory uh, areas of interest is how to apply consumer protection measures, as Dirk said, uh, then how to apply AML measures, use of IDs registered in one jurisdiction on a blockchain in other jurisdiction, ICOs, utility tokens, money laundering exchanges, and systemic effects. So uh, one, one might ask is why on earth would you, if, if you've got a, a multi-trillion dollar um, market in the world versus the multi-billion dollar market in crypto outside the, uh, the financial system, no centralized issue, where the systemic effects would be, well, I think you, you need to telegraph what might happen with uh, the ETFs that are being created uh, with crypto assets to see whether or not uh, those would create some systemic effect. But banks and uh, folks like Goldman Sachs get involved in it and the, the, the value of the crypto and the ETF crashes, much like the uh, collateralized debt did with um, mortgages in 2008 and caused the Great Recession. So those are issues that people are, are, are talking about. Uh, so what's been regulated, and we'll go into this in more depth, regulation of cryptocurrency exchanges in Japan, they've actually embraced that, one of the first in the jurisdiction of the world to do so. Banning of exchanges, China, a uh, very prominent ban, and in Zimbabwe, crypto trading, Saudi Arabia, holding of cryptocurrencies in Bangladesh and Saudi Arabia, ICOs, US, USA, and Thailand, um, use of bank accounts for cryptocurrency funding, that's Australia, India, and Zimbabwe. A uh, very specific targeted ban in the US, 
um, towards Venezuela and its own cryptocurrency, the Petrocoin, um, and then, as I said, use of the local power grid for mining. And some U.S. states uh, have got got own laws uh, about that. Um, there's also in China just recently a ban on meetings to even discuss crypto assets, uh, and also a ban on social network chats. Vietnam has banned the import of mining equipment for um, Bitcoin mining. Um, AML KYC considerations, um, and then Bitcoin is a legal form of payment in Japan has been allowed, and then self-regulation of exchanges in Japan and South Korea. So that's just a few uh, examples. And just to emphasize again, uh, there's there's a big difference, as I showed you by that uh, that those those circles within each other, uh, those hierarchies, there's a very different uh, set of regulations between blockchain and cryptocurrency regulations. I keep keep them in mind, they're not the same. Obviously the risk of different currency versus infrastructure, infrastructure being the blockchain and currency being the Bitcoin and any other crypto, uh, cryptocurrency. So we have some challenges to, uh, to figure this all out. Uh, some capacity building needs to be done, I believe, with regulators around the world. Um, and especially in the legal definitions, again, talking about that term immutability, still this two years after immutability, the immutability issue was was, was prodded and uh, um, found to be wanting um, in 2016 with Ethereum and DAO. Uh, so definitions can make or break a law uh, and create arbitrage. So what I believe is that it needs to be future proof uh, technology neutral and more principles based. So whatever you do, don't mention the technology because some innovator is going to out uh, uh, out innovate your your law, if you will, and just get around it by uh, by by coming up with some innovation that uh, the law doesn't reference. So don't put laws uh, technologies in laws or regulations. Just just say more principles based. I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable, but uh, there you are. Um, some, some of the terms that are uh, got varying definitions, blockchains, uh, node, a DLT, a cryptocurrency, a ICO, uh, smart contract, and even the, the seemingly simple word uh, decentralized. So let's just do a deeper dive now that we look at the, the, the overriding issues of the global responses. Um, so these are your, your global bodies or your SSB standard setting bodies, if you will. As they're also known as the B20, FATF, Financial Stability Board, IMF, uh, OECD, World Bank, and they've each, to some degree, uh, come out with position papers. And this is still evolving, as I said. So even even a few days ago, there have been some, some some movements, and there will still be some movements and clarifications in the next few weeks. So this is just a, a, a snapshot of what the situation is now, rather than a codified law or, or policy. Um, so the global responses uh, right now is uh, range from a clampdown to comparatively light, light touch regulatory approaches. Uh, as I said on AML, you, that, that's, you can always rely on FATF and AML. Uh, that, that will never go away. All the other things will, will, um, will, will, will change. But as far as de-risking, where uh, if FATF or, um, or the like uh, see um, some money laundering going on where there's no Understanding of beneficial ownership, so who's receiving um, value at the end end of the chain, the value chain, uh, then there might be sanctions and you might be de-risked. In other words, cut off from the, the financial ecosystem. Uh, so we've seen a few of that uh, happening in the Caribbean and the Pacific Rim Islands and in, in Africa. Um, and then there's the security and systemic uh, focus from the Financial St Stability Board. So G20 very. Very quickly, there's no overriding policy. It's just a lot of statements post the uh, 20 meetings as recently as uh, two weeks ago. Um, says that crystal assets raise issues with respect to consumer investment protection. So these are all boilerplate uh, issues, uh, but more importantly, they've given FATF, which is a creation of the G20, uh, until October uh, this, uh, this year, I believe for reviewing global AML standards on cryptocurrencies. So FATF Financial Action uh, Task Force is uh, in fact published a guidance, what they call a, a risk-based approach to virtual currencies in 2015. 
they recommend uh, the recommendations apply to convertible virtual currency exchanges in the context of virtual currencies identify ml cft measures that could be required uh, and identify obstacles to applying mitigating measures okay um so the overall factor view is that decentralized systems particularly vulnerable to anonymity risks and that there's no central oversight body and no AML software they believe currently available to monitor and identify suspicious transaction patterns. I actually found a, a, um, a startup called Point Firm that does some sort of um, AML check. You can check whether or not the node has been a bad actor at some stage. So take, take it at Point Firm. Um, they also believe that law enforcement cannot target one central location or entity. For investigation. So, I mean, these are these are, are boilerplate uh, issues, and we'll see what comes out of the next set of um, uh, issue: lack of standardization. They believe suspicious transaction reports, they say, are rising, uh, which may signal use of cryptocurrencies by criminals, uh, but also a high awareness. Um, and what they say is that they believe there's a link between cryptocurrencies and other predicate crimes. So, those are crimes that create the money laundering issues, the predicate crimes. Financial Stability Board um, is also an organization that was uh, uh, created um, after the financial crisis, uh, focused on analyzing and making recommendations to the G20 on global financial systems. It's presented a framework, and I'll, I'll give a snapshot. It's, it's better that you read it offline, uh, but it's, it's got a lot of detail, and I'd be hard pressed to, to give it um, uh, uh, its prominence in, in just one, one slide. Uh, lists several metrics to monitor developing crypto markets, uh, which it says should help identify mitigated risks to consumer and investor protection, market integrity, and potentially financial stability. So it's, it's undertaking monitoring efforts uh, with uh, what it calls crypto assets, price volatility, and size and growth of initial coin offerings. And all of this will feed into um, G20 through uh, qualitative reports. Um, so just a quick snapshot, those are the metrics uh, that the FSB uh, issued in July this year to, uh, to be initially monitored by the FSB. So these are initial data points that they're going to be, be looking at. So watch this space. Okay, so let's go drill down a bit further into national and regional approaches. This sounds super interesting. Uh, again, just going back to my earlier point is we've gone from reactive, ban it all, uh, uh, status to uh, actions to more of a framework approach where it's more organized, more regularized, and more more codified uh, with, a, with a lot of thought going into it. So this is from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, this is the, the, the status of um, regulated views towards um, crypto assets um, per se. So you'll see green is the US, uh, contentious is uh, uh, Russia, uh, hostile China and unknown in a lot of parts of, of Africa and uh, green obviously in, in Europe. And this is the legal status of Bitcoin worldwide, again from Wikipedia. I actually think this needs to be updated a little bit. Uh, but this, this I took uh, a few days ago. Uh, again, you can see the hostiles versus the um, permissive or contentious. So Russia, contentious um, uh, uh, and uh, also in China and uh, and India. So look at the European Union. Uh, again, this is there's nothing yet other than sort of national policies. Uh, so at an EU-wide level, there's a couple of codifications, but there was a meeting held on September the seventh, uh, discussing challenges posed by crypto assets, as well as the possibility of enacting stricter regulations. So uh, the EU is concerned, it says, about lack of transparency in transactions uh, and um, just circling back to the money laundering components, potential use of cryptocurrencies to conduct illegal activities, such as tax evasion. Again, boilerplate issues uh, that, that aren't seemingly particular just to uh, the cryptocurrency, but uh, there's no policy around it, so that's why it's front and center. Uh, European Commission has unveiled the European Blockchain Partnership. Uh, and this is the embracing part, I would say. Uh, and then uh, also there's the um, the, the uh, EU's fifth money laundering directive, 
Um, so regulates crypto exchanges and wallet providers, and they're required to introduce customer due diligence procedures, including um, verification and requires some um, uh, requirement for registration of, of platforms or exchanges. Okay, so here's an interesting one. Uh, this is quite progressive. This came out a few few months ago from Malta, who now style themselves as the uh, blockchain island. Um, indeed, that's what they call themselves. Now, uh, Maltese Parliament enacted three new laws enabling DLT-based businesses. And in fact, as you'll see now, a couple of exchanges have migrated to there. Uh, there's a Malta Digital Innovation Authority Bill, Technology Arrangements and Services Bill, and the Virtual Financial Assets Bill. So those cover uh, ICOs, your virtual financial assets, or crypto assets as we're calling them now. Um, and then there's the technology component, which is your DLTs. And, uh, and then there's a regulatory authority, uh, which they've created. So in all, it creates a regulatory framework for blockchain technology. It's the first uh, jurisdiction, uh, I believe, with laws that comprehensively covers treatment of cryptocurrencies, launch of ICOs, and blockchain DLT service providers and services, uh, including the setting up of, of exchanges. So the framework from Malta provides um, uh, exchanges with a clear and navigable regulatory framework. So uh, OKX, BitBay, Binance, um, uh, migrated to Malta in a bit to escape regulatory pressure in their home market. So you can see from May, the, the move towards Malta has been um, quite uh, quite rapid. And we'll see, see what happens. Uh, just to just to emphasize the point about technology neutrality and principles-based uh, um, definitions in laws and regulations, uh, there's no mention. Here's a definition of distributed led technology, uh, which it says means a database system in which information is recorded, consensually shared, and synchronized across a network of multiple nodes. Very very uh, generic, but uh, useful. Uh, in fact, there's no mention of blockchain in any of these laws. And the asset, DLT assets, means a virtual token, virtual financial assets, or electronic money or financial instruments. I, I don't believe, uh, I, I would take issue with the use of electronic money in there because um, electronic money is subject to a totally different directive and uh, on a one-to-one -one, uh, fiat backing. So I, I don't know why they've included it, um, but uh, it, it doesn't seem appropriate for that. Uh, this is a Swiss DLT framework. This came out a good few months ago. So you'll see now we've now differentiating between these ICOs, they call it for utility token, uh, utility tokens on the left, um, payment tokens. So that would be your cryptocurrency, and um, and then uh, asset tokens would be, would be your pure uh, initial coin offering. And there's a little test they've given. Uh, to see whether or not it's uh, uh, subject to the to the regulator, and you can certainly Google that. Um, that's, that's a super interesting set of guidelines. Uh, this is the most uh, interesting one uh, this month. Abu Dhabi framework just came out, and I believe it was put together by um, with help some of the Australian regulators. And you'll see this this kind of encapsulates where we're going in terms of regulating. Um, Crypto crypto assets. Uh, you'll see on the left um, your utility tokens, non-security tokens, uh, then security tokens, which are called digital assets with security characteristics. Uh, so effectively your ICOs, uh, and then your crypto assets, which are effectively your means of payment, your cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, Ether, etc. And here's here's the interesting bit: here's the derivative funds. Uh, derivatives over digital assets, collective investment funds investing in, in digital assets. Um, so I, I believe um, I stand subject to confirmation the UK framework uh, will look much like this with two or three other um, sets of uh, regulated entities uh, on the right hand side beyond the derivatives. So there'll be two, two or more, I believe. I saw a snapshot of it, but I don't know if that was, there was a draft, but I don't know if it's the, the final version. We'll see when that comes out. But just to emphasize that um, market intermediaries and crypto asset exchanges uh, will be need to be licensed uh, by the Financial Service Regulatory Authority in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. So uh, an interesting approach and one of the first of many, uh, much like Switzerland and the like. 
So let's go to the, the, the big daddy of them all, the US. Uh, look at the federal level um, number of regulators, and of course you'll, you'll, you'll know that there are federal laws and then there are state laws. So these are the, uh, the, the, uh, the federal regulators, Securities and Exchange Commission being very prominent in terms of ICO and that's fast evolving. Uh, CFTC, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, that's your Financial Intelligence Unit looking at money laundering. IRS looking at tax issues and OFAC um, looking at sanctions. So these are just some of the, uh, the federal regulators. Um, federal Reserve and IRS have taken the following positions that Bitcoin are not currency, but a taxable commodity. Uh, they're not recognized as legal tender, but they're similar to property. Um, and capital gains on uh, these coins is uh, taxable as uh, gains would be in stocks and bonds. So the analogy is, is there. So here's an interesting enforcement action that took place a few months ago by the SEC, reported Operation Crypto Suite for ICOs targeted 44 jurisdictions from US and Canada, uh, 70 plus inquiries, 35 pending, and uh, this, these are their slides. Uh, so there might be a few more since, uh, since this was published a few months ago. So this is what they looked at, and you'll see there's this is an ICO that they shut down, and um, this, this ICO, you can see on the top left, that picture of that gentleman, Mr. Mark Robert of the UK, Kate Jennifer of Chicago, and Inito An of Russia, and of course that's complete nonsense because uh, client testimonials were obviously not from Prince Charles, who's, who's pictured there, Jennifer Aniston, and then on the right hand side, the former Finnish uh, Prime Minister. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is what's this called? This is the Lead Invest ICO. Again, this is all from the SEC. There's a picture of the, the, the Legal Teams Code of Ethics Association, uh, and you'll see that lady in red there that is clearly not on their board. That, of course, is Supreme Court um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as well as um, chap on the on the to, to her uh, to the left. Um, uh, our left is the ex of the general. So, so the state level gets a bit more complicated. So here's the Arizona law, and and um, I think uh, I Joe referenced it slightly. And yes, they you know, put in red there that they use the word immutable. So this is a few months ago, even though our issue with immutable uh, was was raised uh, two years ago uh, with Dow. So this is a 2018 law using uh, issues that have been been canvassed uh, two years ago. Um, so here's actually an interesting one I just extracted from the from one of the other uh, subsidiary laws, a county, which is a local council, may not prohibit or otherwise restrict an individual from running a node on a blockchain technology in a residence. So this is a prohibition on a prohibition at a state level, because uh, we've seen uh, some local councils worry about the electricity supply. Okay, so here's a more interesting definition. Again, uh, this has just come out from Florida, and there's a definition of blockchain technology, again, not technology neutral. Uh, and there they use the word immutable in red at the bottom. And more interestingly, and I have no idea how you actually legally argue this, they call um, a blockchain technology an uncensored truth. There you have it. Interesting definitions from around the world. And Tennessee uh, also um, defines a smart contract. So we're seeing a lot of definitions of smart contracts. Uh, percolating out in the US. Uh, India, uh, last few slides. Reserve Bank of India, you probably will be aware, uh, has banned uh, banks from dealings with crypto related businesses and persons, and the people affected uh, took, took this ban to the Indian Supreme Court at a hearing on September 11th, and that still hasn't been resolved. Uh, the court, however, ruled not to grant interim relief to those affected by the ban. But the Reserve Bank has created an interdepartmental group to study and provide guidance um, uh, on the desirability of and feasibility of a, a central bank digital currency, also known as digital fiat currency. So there again is your tension. Ban, ban crypto uh, currencies means a payment that are not um, don't have a central issuer, but also embrace 
the view of uh, uh, the, the, the possibility of creating a, uh, um, a fiat current, digital fiat currency, CBDC, issued by the central bank itself. So it's got its own issues, which that's a separate discussion in and of itself. So Bangladesh, very quickly, it's uh, banned. So uh, it's a punishable act. So ban, ban, ban. China, uh, yes, this is this is. Caused the most fluctuations, I believe, in in especially the Bitcoin and altcoin icing. Uh, all currency exchanges, domestic uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, that is, domestic and international banned. Bank account freezes. Um, guidelines have also been de developed to discover discourage Bitcoin mining um, through limiting power usage. Uh, in August, a few uh, about a few weeks ago. The ban on uh, on meeting to discuss cryptocurrency on on, on WeChat uh, came up, but again, here's the tension between regulating and embracing. The ministry is looking to create a national block blockchain standards, um, and the State Council of China has ordered local financial authorities and research centres to focus on the development of blockchain and accelerated commercialization, while ICO funding is is banned. Japan, um, uh, very progressive. Um, they came out with the Payment Services Act of 2016, requires virtual currency exchanges. They didn't ban anything, they regulated the exchanges. Uh, you've got to register as an exchange with the Financial Services uh, Agency. I think this is because of a lot of the, uh, the exchanges that collapsed and people lost their money, uh, Mt. Gox, et cetera. Uh, I think some of the Mt. Gox money is actually being released. Uh, establish uh, proper security systems to protect business information. Um, there's also act on prevention of transfer of criminal proceeds. Uh, that includes now um, currency exchanges where they, the exchanges are obligated to check the identity, identities of customers who open accounts and also um, uh, need to create uh, suspicious transaction reports. Um, and it's, uh, it, it Japan's also testing the use of blockchain for accepting government contracts. So you can see there's uh, uh, there's a lot of progressive thought there. They recognise cryptocurrencies as money, a property value that can be used to buy goods and services rather than a currency. But uh, um, importantly, stop short of calling it uh, a cryptocurrency legal tender, which is another discussion as to what legal tender means. So that's it from from me on the on the regulation side. Uh, and again, if you've got any uh, questions, um, please send them through to the um, um, uh, to the moderator. And in fact, I think we already have uh, one question. And we'll just do one question because we we're, we're running out of uh, we're running out of time. Um, okay, so from Sandra in Melbourne. Uh, Sandra, thanks for staying up. I think it's maybe 1 a.m. in the morning in Melbourne. Thank you for staying up late for this. Um, question is, do you think there will be a supranational law on blockchain so that there is consistency across the world? Um, not yet. Uh, I think uh, it, it's going to percolate more through the standard setting bodies, the SSBs, through the G20, uh, and as I said, uh, through, through FATF. So, uh, at the very least, and again, as you see, uh, a lot of my dates are, are very, very contemporaneous, almost approximate. Uh, this, this is fast evolving, so we're not sure what say the G20, FSB, uh, uh, and the like other SSBs are going to um, uh, issue. But at the very minimum, I think that your money laundering uh, statutes will, uh, because of the risking uh, risks. Um, to, to, to countries will, will be uh, front and center and, and uh, will inform any policies and regulations that, uh, that uh, are done at a, at, a, at a national level. So uh, we're a little over time. Uh, thank you for your patience in, in staying up or getting up uh, early for this. Um, I, I, we appreciate it, Dirk, uh, Joe, and myself, and Mike here in New York with me. Uh, we thank you very much for your participation, your attention. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, send it to info at uh, dfsobservatory.com, info at dfsobservatory.com.
uh, dot com, and we'll pass it on to whoever you you want to address the 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 um, the, uh, the question to. I I happen to tweet a lot on blockchain DLT technologies I do with CFS. So there's my my Twitter handle, uh, very simply Leon Perlman, um, and um, hopefully we can all interact. And again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, for those who came late, the recording will be available uh, um, in, in the next week or two on our website, dfsobservatory.com. So if you missed the last section, uh, uh, sorry, the first session. Um, oh my Thank you very much. Goodness. Uh, some noise coming through, but thank you again for everybody for participating. And goodbye from New York.